Illinois Medical Center in Roma, Illinois, and a visiting religion professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and about this at the Biblical Seminary at Eastern Illinois Seminary. She works at the intersection of biblical studies and peace studies, also is the New Testament editor of the Studies in Peace and Scripture series with the Institute of Mennonite Studies, Welcome, Laura. Calenthea Dowdy was born, raised, and continues to reside in the city of love, Philadelphia. <laughs> she is the director of faith initiatives at Philadelphia Fight, which is a HIV AIDS organization, and is on the faculty of Eastern University at St. David's in Blanca is originally from Colombia and has worked with Mennonite Church uh, in the United States since 2001. She is the pastor at Iglesia Menonita Comunidad de Vida in San Antonio, Texas. So, welcome, Blanca and Valencia. Uh, okay. Let's welcome her. Uh, relationship. Uh, it was an abusive marriage. Uh, 
physically and emotionally. And, and, and if you know anything about that relationship, at least what we heard publicly, I was often, you can watch the movie, by the way, and their life, the movie at the same time. It was what well, love guys do there. But one of the things we remember uh, was that I was pretty famous for always telling Tina, Tina, baby, I love you. Every time she would threat to me, but I love you. I love you. And the interesting thing was, in the midst of all that love, he was being his wife. In the midst of, I love you, I love you, I love you, I need you, baby, don't leave me. He was abusing the person who was supposed to be closest to him. And it was finally when Tina decided to leave that relationship for good, when she actually realized her own inner liberation through some Buddhist chant, right? That she didn't have to stay in that. And it was out of that context that she wrote this song. So I often wonder, you know, who knows where songs come from, but I often, I often wonder, was Tina bitter after this relationship, after this marriage? where this song came together. I'm not even sure if she wrote it, but what's love got to do with it? It was a hit because so many people related to the song, 1984. Were the people here who weren't born yet? <laughs> <laughs> so just even looking at that relationship, we can see yeah, that's a minor relationship, significant to them for sure, but that there is often a big deep and wide perceptual gulf when it comes to love. How we experience love, how we feel about love, how we feel that we love another person or another person loves us, what we want to experience, what makes us feel like we're in love. What is love? Deep perceptual gulf. Um, in the 90s, and some of you know I do uh, anti-racism work with uh, the masses wrote down, no news, news, justice, that's a little commercial. Um, Emerson and Smith wrote a book in, uh, oh, I don't know, 1999 or so, called Divided by Faith. And in this book, they sought to um, look at race in America and try to understand what was going on as it related to why, why was church, why was 11 o'clock on Sunday morning still the most segregated hour of the week? Right? It was kind of the central core of what they were trying to get at. So they interviewed Christians, right? They interviewed mostly evangelical types, right? They, they interviewed white Christians and black Christians and Latino Christians. And the thing that they came out with, and you notice if you, if you read this book, was they, they found in their study that even both evangelical and non-evangelicals often responded to uh, the race issue with, with the question was, how can we solve the race issue in our church? And often, more often than not, white evangelicals said, just love. We just have to love each other. That's what the Bible tells us. Just love and everything else will fall into place. And so they turned this a miracle motif. Right, this miracle was I had his love and everything else was perfect. Well, Tina Turner knew that wasn't true. You know it's not true, and I know it's not true. My own story, as I think about love and the church, this has been my dilemma. I grew up in a black Baptist church, loved it and hated it, and left when I hit my twenties, and somewhere in my late twenties now, Mennonites. Which was not a black church. <laughs> but I was so black, right, with open arms. My white sisters and brothers said, Calendria, we love you. Join our church, be a part of us. And one church I was involved with a long time ago, I remember that the church became divided over some race issues. And those same sisters, the white women in the church who loved me, were very silent when I needed them to be home. That scarred me. I'm still scarred. That scarred me. What's love? 
Can't see zero there. So often we talk a good game when it comes to love. As women with feminist sensibilities in the church who want to be in solidarity with our black, white, Latino, white sisters, there are things we just don't seem to be able to get over. And yet we talk about it. But we're still quite divided. So this has been my query is going on. What has love got to do with it? And so I thought maybe we just don't understand love. So hopefully by the end of this weekend we'll have it all figured out. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I am encouraged by a couple of things. Three passages that I have meditated on over the past few years, and I noticed every time I talk about this, I've talked about it before. You don't quite know what to do with it, but I trust you. You know what to do with this. John 3.16. That's the verse I got saved by in my Black Baptist Church. God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son that you and I might have eternal life. Great verse. God so loved you and me that God did something. It was an action. I read that verse differently. God so loved the world that God did something. There was an action. God sacrificed God's only son for you and I. That's heavy. So there was an action. Common verse looked at a little bit different. God sacrificed. God gave God's son. That's radical. That is a self-sacrificing act to give up something that is very dear to you. Romans 5, 8. God shows, God displays God's love for us. God's doing something. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God showed us love. And 1 John 4, 9 through 11. In this, the love of God was made manifest. Do you know what that means? To make something manifest. To show, again, to display, to do something. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent God's Son into the world. Love and action. Love and action. Love and action. There can be no love, I'm convinced, without corresponding. Words aren't enough. Love and action are better yet love and justice. There's that word. Two sides of the same. I would offer that if we as sisters in the body of Christ are going to really love one another and show solidarity to one another, we probably have to do something. We probably have to sacrifice something. And that sounds scary. God loved us so much that God sacrificed God's only son. What does it look like to love with corresponding action? What is sacrificial love? What does it mean to give up power and control, things that could be so dear to us, because we love our sisters. What does that look like? God loved us and did something about it. So as I think about love, I want us to at least begin to think about what we may have to give up, what we may have to sacrifice, what we may have to do as sisters to be in solidarity with one another. And it can't just be one way of doing it. It's got to be Amen? Yeah.